A number of years ago, I visited Carlisle Castle for the first time. And I saw a room dedicated to Edward Longshanks. And in that room was a plaque declaring Edward Longshanks the hammer of the Scots. What? The Edward Longshanks tomb in Westminster Abbey is pretty plain. But on it is painted the same message. Eduardus Primus Scotorum Malleus. Edward the First Hammer of the Scots. Now, given that Edward the Confessor was King of England before him, to call him Edward the First seems questionable, at least. So what about the designation of Hammer of the Scots? If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right of the screen. And if you enjoy the video, give a thumbs up and share with others like you. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. On the 28th of March, 1296, Edward Longshanks was 56 years old. He'd done a lot in life. He'd been on crusade, he'd survived assassination attempts, he'd had lots of children, he'd fought battles to retain control of England, he'd pulled the Plantagenet dynasty back from the brink, he'd invaded Wales, and now he was invading Scotland. By August, Edward had slaughtered the inhabitants of Berwick, defeated a Scottish army at Dunbar, stolen the stone of Schoon, ceremonially humiliated John Balliol, the King of Scots, and was back in Berwick, laying down his ordinances for the governance of Scotland. When he handed over control of Scotland to his lieutenant, he's famously said to have quipped, a man does good business when he rids himself of a turd. Oh, is that right, Eddie? We'll see about that. Within less than nine months, there were the first signs of revolt against this new regime. In April 1297, it started with the McDougals and McRuries in the West Highlands. Days later, on the 3rd of May, William Wallace killed the Sheriff of Lanark and then led a group of men from Clydesdale south towards the English border. By the end of May, Andrew de Murray had raised a force in the northeast and was attacking strongholds taken by Edward and Robert the Bruce, the Bishop of Glasgow and others were leading the nobles' revolt in the west. Less than a year after Edward's great triumph, his regime was under attack all over Scotland. Aye, get rid of a turd. You're in the shit new longshanks. Whilst Bruce and the nobles came to terms with the English at Irvine, Edward's men complained that the Scots' insistence on dragging out the negotiation over niggling little petty details was just a ruse to give William Wallace time to train his men in the Ettrick Forest. Worse than that, on the 24th of July, Edward's treasurer in Scotland, Hugh Cressingham, wrote to Edward saying, By far the greater part of your counties of the realm of Scotland are still unprovided with keepers, as well as by death, sieges or imprisonment, and some have given up their bailiwicks, and others neither will nor dare return. And in some counties, the Scots have established and placed bailiffs and ministers so that no county is in its proper order excepting Berwick and Roxburgh. And this only lately. Within a year, despite the nobles' supposed submission to Edward and Irvine, Scots had their own administrative system running parallel to and in competition with Edward's. By September, William Wallace and Andrew de Murray had joined forces to defeat Edward's army at Stirling Bridge and Wallace invaded England. Did you forget to bring a hammer? Edward Hare's situation was precarious enough for him to come back from Flanders. The next year, he brought together a huge force by land and sea and came north. Now, he was getting little, if any, revenue in Scotland, and food for his troops was scarce. 
Fiona Watson's book, Under the Hammer, will show you the vast quantities of supplies that Edward was drawing. It came from England, from Ireland and from Wales and it caused a huge strain on him as his royal coffers emptied. But just before they ran out of food, whilst the English and Welsh troops were arguing amongst themselves, in July, William Wallace presented an opportunity at Falkirk, where Edward's huge force and the emerging threat of the longbow decimated Wallace's shilterns. Having routed what was left of Wallace's forces, Edward's cavalry stayed in Scotland long enough to take some castles and destroy some towns. Okay, so that was a win for Edward. Although Robert the Bruce burned air before Edward could take it. Eventually, short of food, Longshanks here turned south again. So how did things go after that? For years after Falkirk, the English controlled a few castles and centres in the southeast of Scotland, little, if anything, in the west, and nothing north of Stirling. How secure were they? I'll tell you. Orders were given that no English should leave Berwick-upon-Tweed into enemy territory unless they had 30 men at arms and 500 foot soldiers from the garrison. I think you're going to need a bigger hammer, mate. Money had to be continually sent north to pay for troops and supplies for the patches of southern Scotland that he did hold. But what about south of the border? Three months after Edward's glorious victory at Falkirk, the Sheriff of Cumberland said that he couldn't attend a deadline in York because during the present war between the King and the Scots, who lately invaded the said parts and caused much damage and put them in much danger, the county could not be without its Sheriff. And so he couldn't leave for York. Two months later, Edward was sending urgent messages to his English sheriffs asking for money from any possible source. Five months after that, he was writing to his tenants and citizens in Gascony that he would pay off his debts to them with all the taxes on wool, hides and wool fells in England, Ireland and Scotland. After that land is in good peace. Edward wasn't wielding a hammer, but holding out a begging bowl. Why? Because he was in trouble in Scotland. He sent instructions that 600 men at arms should be sent north to Edinburgh carrying money to pay men's wages so that they could relieve the besieged English in Stirling Castle. Which expedition is to be done as hastily as you can? The English garrison at Stirling was cut off from the rest of English-held Scotland. That was December 1298. In January 1300, news arrived in York, telling them Stirling had been surrendered. On a diplomatic front, Edward had been forced to release the King of Scots, John Balliol, from captivity in London into papal custody in France. For Edward, the six years after the Battle of Falkirk were grinding, difficult and expensive. With successes, yes, but also crushing defeats. Like the one led by John Cummin at the Battle of Roslyn. I made a video about that much underreported Scottish victory and you can see it by clicking the tab top right. Now don't get me wrong, the years of warfare were no cakewalk for Scotland either. After the winter of 1303-1304, when Edward managed to keep troops in the field over winter, most Scots thought it was time for a compromise. And a compromise it was.
Before we look at the compromise, can I remind you that I'll be doing work in progress versions of my show Scotland Made the World in the Stand Comedy Clubs in Edinburgh and Glasgow, both on the 19th of January, then on to Perth, Australia, Adelaide, Melbourne, Hobart, Canberra, Sydney, Brisbane, Auckland, Wellington, Christchurch and Dunedin. Click the link top right or in the description below for tickets. On the 11th of January 1304, a letter was sent to Edward's representatives offering a negotiated peace. The deal that the Scotch nobles offered was that none of them would be killed, none of them would be maimed or imprisoned. They would keep their property and there would be pardons all round. On the 2nd of February 1304, Edward sent his response. Agreeing to the key demands of the Scots, but refusing to pardon William Wallace. After a bit of back and forth, on the 5th of February, a team of negotiators met in person. By March, Edward held a parliament at St Andrews. Eight years it had taken him since the last one. This time, he observed Scottish law and custom. The new settlement was very different from the one in 1296. Appointees to key positions in sheriffdoms included Scots. Rebel Scots. Now the reason that Edward's terms were so generous wasn't because Edward Longshanks was a generous person. It was because he knew the reality of the situation. If there was a hammer, it was the one that smashed open his piggy bank and left him without a pot to piss in. Oh my God. Hammer my arse. Now there's a whole mixture of metaphors that you don't want to unwrap in a hurry. Everyone was knackered. And in the words of Dr Fiona Watson, whose book Under the Hammer gives a proper historian's approach to this period, says... There's only one real explanation for this change of attitude. The years of war had taught Edward I that in contrast to the conquest of Wales, and indeed to his first conquest of 1296, it was extremely unwise to treat Scotland in a way that might prompt its people to resist. In fact, resistance wasn't yet finished. You see, when Edward left that St Andrew's Parliament on the 5th of April, he headed to Stirling, the key castle that still held out against the invader. The castle was finally handed over on the 25th of July. Two years later, on the 22nd of May 1306, Edward held a huge banquet in celebration of chivalry at Westminster, where 267 men were knighted. Included in the feast and pageantry was the presentation of gold-decorated swans that gave the celebration its name, the Feast of the Swans. The aging Edward Longshanks, who had lived an incredible life, surviving assassination attempts, collapsed buildings, trampling by horses, battles and crusade, still had a major item on his bucket list. And he swore an oath before God and the swans to achieve it before he died. To finally conquer the Scots. He knew that was a job still unfinished. You see, in 1304, at the very point that Edward was bombarding Stirling Castle with a siege engine, when he thought he was winning his final victory against the Scots, Bishop Lamberton of St Andrews and Robert Bruce, Earl of Carrick, signed a bond right under his nose promising to undo all that Edward was doing and had done with his war machines. Two years later, in admittedly dubious circumstances, that pledge had become a reality and Robert Bruce was crowned King of Scots at Schoon. The reason 
that Edward held the Feast of the Swans and created a new generation of English knights was because he had to set off and campaign again. He knew that the Scots hadn't been hammered. Edward headed north, but he never reached Scotland. Scotland is about five miles that way, but this is as far as he got. It's why his statue stands in the town next to the Greyhound pub. It's why in the middle of a field, a monument stands here. An elderly man, wizened by dysentery, with his aides having to lift him out of his bed to help him eat. He died here at Brough by Sands, with Scotland just a few miles to the north, unconquered. He asked that in death his bones be taken in front of an army to defeat the Scots and that his heart be taken on crusade. Neither one happened. He was buried in a plain tomb in Westminster. Maybe because there was no cash left after his years of fruitless efforts. I tell you whose heart was taken on crusade though. That's right. Robert the Bruce. But that inscription was added to his tomb in the 16th century. Edward I, Hammer of the Scots. Aye, right. If you want to know how Edward's fruitless quest started, then watch the video coming up on screen now. Support the channel by clicking top right to become a Patreon member or buy me a coffee in the description below. In the meantime, I mean, dog is going to be a lot of my life. Cheerio and